Uh, today I'm going to summarize the last uh, 12 years of post-excavation research on the Newport Ship Project in about 15 minutes, so uh, it's going to be a, quite a flying tour. Uh, for those of you that don't know about the Newport Ship, it's a, a massive medieval clinker-built merchant ship that was discovered in the summer of 2002 on the riverbank in Newport in uh, South Wales, in the United Kingdom. It's uh, approximately uh, 3,000 pieces of timber articulated, uh, found in the bottom of a coffer dam uh, in advance of uh, construction work on this uh, riverfront theater and arts center. And uh, it wasn't just the ship that was found, there was also a thousand artifacts. Uh, we know that it was built uh, sometime uh, after 1449, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about the dendro in a bit. And uh, we know that it came into Newport uh, after 1468, but before 1469. Uh, and we know that uh, based on the artifactual and environmental remains in the vessel that it had substantial trade and other links with the Iberian Peninsula, especially Portugal, uh, it's amazingly well preserved. Uh, it's, it's anoxic river mud. There were over seven meters of mud lying on top of the vessel, of the remains of the vessel, and uh, it was waterlogged and anoxic. And you can see just the condition of the site. Uh, You've got the uh, archaeologists actually able to walk back and forth on the uh, timbers of the vessel. And we, we know that it was partially salvaged in antiquity as well. So we don't have the entire vessel, but we have a substantial portion of the bottom out to the turn of the bilge on the port side, a little bit more than that actually, and then we have up to the uh, 35th strake on the uh, starboard side, uh, at least up to the level of the uh, first deck. Uh, we believe the ship was brought into Newport, like I said, late 1460s. It was uh, brought in on a very high spring tide up the river and turned into a side channel in the River Usk, uh, right in the town center. And it was, there was a cradle structure that had been put in place, big logs or struts uh, pre-erected. And the ship was deballasted and floated in and perched on this cradle. And uh, it looks like they were doing a major refit to the vessel. We know this because there's timbers in the ship from 1465 and British being fitted into the ship. But it looks like this cradle structure somehow collapses and the ship leans over onto its <coughs> side, and very quickly, we have a huge tidal range here, uh, 14 meters, uh, and it looks like the ship over on its side like that floods with the next incoming tide, and we have evidence that they're attempting to pump the vessel out, they're attempting to right it, but uh, they eventually give up and switch gears from refitting the vessel to actually salvaging all that they can still reach, the upper bits, the masts, uh, uh, all the upper works are basically gone. They go about salvaging the vessel, and eventually it fills in with this mud and water and uh, becomes buried in this uh, inlet. I should have said they brought the ship into a side channel or a pill, uh, uh, that we, a paleo channel. And we know this paleo channel had been in uh, existence from at least the uh, uh, Iron Age because we found Iron Age burial uh, underneath the ship, literally Iron Age touching uh, medieval. But it's an extremely complicated dynamic site uh, based on its location in the middle of a medieval settlement and the fact that uh, there's been a uh, huge depth of uh, time of settlement and uh, habitation in this area. It's incredibly complex and uh, it's like a washing machine. Even though it's kind of a terrestrial site inside of a river, uh, there's a huge amount of contamination from the medieval settlement. So it's been quite a task over the years to pick out you know, what, what belongs to the ship itself and what belongs to uh, uh, the uh, medieval and later and earlier uh, times. Anyway, the uh, the ship itself was uncovered and then uh, disassembled into all of its uh, component pieces. Many of the long pieces, the stringers and the keel, were cut into more manageable sections. And the ship was basically taken apart in the reverse order that it was made. And so the last uh, pieces to come out were the, uh, the planking shell and then, and then the keel. The, uh, quite a mess. Uh, when they were salvaging the vessel, a huge amount of over a thousand loose timbers were found inside the hull. So we have 2,000 articulated timbers and another thousand timbers that are placed, that, that uh, we believe were attached to the ship, but then fell inwards. And you can see <coughs> big knees, beams, uh, half a dozen of these uh, hatch covers, all sorts of carlings and deck beams, uh, all mixed in. And we spent years trying to sort out this mess on top of the ship, as well as the uh, articulated hull. And just gives you an idea of the intact nature of everything. You have the mast step and uh, all the braces. Uh, quite a bit of damage was caused, caused to the ship during the installation of the uh, sheet pile coffer dam. They had no idea the ship was there when they were doing this construction work. They punched in a big sheet pile coffer dam, maybe six times the size of this room, 
and the ship actually goes corner to corner across there perfectly, perfectly contained. They flipped off a couple meters in the bow and maybe a meter in the stern, uh, but that wasn't enough, so they drove uh, 17 of these. <laughs> they drove 92 half meter by half meter concrete piles across this several hectare site. Uh, 17 of them pierced the ship, punched right through it. So actually disassembling the thing is quite a task. And um, I'd go on for hours about that. But, uh, well, <laughs> if you want to know more, I, I can tell you more about the excavation. But the long and short of it is uh, the vessel was disassembled and raised. We have this huge warehouse, uh, 50 by 50 meters, 17 of these 5 by 10 meter tanks filled with medieval ship. And that's the project as of 2004. So we walked into this warehouse. It, 2002 is the excavation, and then everything's soaking in water. We go into this warehouse, and we have thousands of medieval ship timbers, some of them weigh a ton each, and just packed into these tanks. And so we set about, this is the warehouse, we set about uh, cleaning and recording. We did a little one-year pilot study, and then we, with the results of kind of figuring out how to deal with all this material, we then hired a bigger team and started to clean and record the entire ship uh, timber assemblage with an eye towards uh, your documentation and then conservation with the hope of eventual uh, assembly and uh, display. So we set about uh, working away. Uh, the timbers were, uh, the entire ship is oak with the exception of the keel, which is beech. Again, very well preserved, except for the keel. Uh, and uh, everything was covered with concretion. It's a lap straight vessel, uh, uh, wrought iron clench nails, and then wooden tree nails fastening the hull to the framing. We have a just most remarkable level of preservation on the organic artifacts, and especially the, organic, the, the timbers. They were covered in a lot of animal, uh, uh, to, uh, wood tar and animal fiber in the in the seams or the, the joints, and it uh, uh, also concretions where the, all the wrought iron fasteners had corroded up. We spent a long time chipping all these off, and what was underneath was incredible. The surface of the timbers was like the day they'd been uh, cut. We have many. We have I don't know 1,200 examples of inscribed lines, uh, perfectly preserved, just a millimeter or two deep, uh, inscribed on the timbers, both inboard and outboard. We've got hundreds of examples of parallel lines which we interpret as count marks, and they do line up actually, some of them when you count back from the, say, the bow uh, along the straight. It's, you know, three, three for the third one, four for the fourth one back. And what's even more remarkable, I mean, I don't know if you can tell, well, you can see this, this is the impression of the nail head. They drove the nails in so hard they really crushed the wood on both sides, kind of perfect nail head, perfect row, uh, inboard, outboard. And uh, can you see the star there? That was that was the maker's mark on the underside of the nail head that's transferred over into the timbers. That nail's long gone, but that, uh, that mark remains. We have that level of detail even on the outboard of the ship. So uh, you can see we have 3,000 timbers covered in marks like this. It's like a thesis on every single timber. <laughs> <laughs> Hundreds of fasteners, uh, so many repairs. It's just, it's just fascinating. So we said about recording all of the material we used uh, Ferroarm contact digitizers and rhinoceros software. We made three-dimensional digital drawings of every single timber. Uh, very, very accurate, uh, relatively quick, and a very versatile digital record. We started doing this in 2004. Uh, we more or less finished up with the basic recording in 2007 and 8. Then we, and we had four of these Ferroarms. So was, we basically ran it like a big factory. We had four of these recording stations. We had three uh, cleaning stations, and we had uh, at the peak, I think we had 15 people working there, and by my math, as of last year, we've done 110,000 hours of post -ex. Not counting the excavation, just what we've done in this warehouse, uh, just to process this, uh, this huge ship. So keep that in mind if you ever think about doing this. <laughs> somebody, on, somebody early on in the excavation said it would take two years, start to finish, including conservation. <laughs> somebody told some politician that, and, that's, and we've been fighting that ever since. Uh, so we had nice 3D digital records. We then uh, partnered up with Cardiff University, and this is early days for 3D printing. We used laser sintering, and we would make 1 to 10 scale digital models of each of our ship parts, uh, the planking, the framing, the stringers. We would email like 200 files over to Cardiff. They'd load them up in the machine, print them out. A couple weeks later, we'd get a box posted back of 1 to 10 scale ship parts. We bolted those together, one piece at a time, in the same order we believe they built the ship in. And we ended up with a 110 scale uh, model of the Newport ship, the, the exit hull remains. And it was amazing. The ship in the ground was pretty much flat, it had a huge amount of sediment on top of it. 
taken apart, we recorded the ship in all of its individual pieces, we made these model pieces, we didn't attempt to correct any distortion, we just uh, drew the pieces as they sat on the table and then modeled them the same way. We bolted it together and the ship went like this. It just, it's under so much tension, it's it basically, I, I'm not going to claim it's perfect, but it's probably 85% back to what it should be. And really, we don't see much what I would consider global distortion, it's localized areas of distortion where the piles went through or where the ship was lying on the cradle. And we've been working to correct those areas. We have uh, very high resolution digital data, many different uh, levels. You know, we have the ship timbers themselves, we have the hull form model. We laser scan that model and we put it into the digital world and we started to fare it. And then we started to ghost in both physically on the model and digitally. We started ghosting in the uh, missing areas and trying to reconstruct what was the missing areas and fix the uh, damaged areas. And so we then were able to create quite sophisticated three-dimensional digital models based on this primary archaeological data. We've got, um, uh, once we created these models, uh, they're three-dimensional digital, we were able to run them through programs like Orca. We use Rhino for everything and then Orca's a, a plugin for Rhino. We're able to create these uh, uh, construction drawings and cutaway views. We were able to fill the ship with, uh, fill the hole with uh, you know, how much, see how much cargo it can take. And then we were able to model that. We were able to basically recreate what the ship would, how it would behave uh, with these different loads and different sail areas. And so this work is going on right now, and we're, uh, we're just kind of learning new things every day. But uh, it's uh, once you start with high-resolution digital data, you have so many more options when you get to these later post-excavation research uh, and analysis. Uh, Points. So this is where we're at now. It took years to get here because we had to digitally record every single timber. And at best, you might be able to record a couple timbers a day. Uh, but and when you have a huge assemblage like this, I mean, it works brilliantly on like a 10 meter ship. But this is a 30 meter ship, and it's uh, you know, uh, orders of magnitude more work, I'd say. So uh, bottom line right now, we're looking at a, uh, you know, a late medieval, uh, mid 15th century uh, merchant ship and a total displacement of just under about 400 tons. And uh, based on our uh, uh, historical archival research, uh, this is you know pretty typical size. Um, uh, nothing really surprising about it. it. In my mind, it's probably the bog standard merchant uh, ship in Northern Europe during this period. Uh, and it's it's well, I that's just kind of the outline of the ship itself. I just want to say a little bit about some of the artifacts we found that have helped us determine kind of flesh out the uh, life and times of the ship. Uh, brilliant artifact we only found a few years ago. We were cleaning the keel, and right in the, the front of the keel where it scarfs, the stem scarfs over it, about half a meter back, they cut a little tiny hole in the inboard face. And so you got the stem on here going up like that. They purposely inserted this small silver French coin in that, uh, in that little rebate. And then they put the stem on and a couple hundred nails through it and built the rest of the ship around it. Uh, only minted for two months in uh, 1447. <laughs> uh, we have done a, we've taken over 300 dendro samples. I mean, the conservators hated it, but we would go in every chance we got and we would cut planks in half and just amazing sequences. We were uh, uh, just in the last couple of years able to pin down the planking of the ship. It matches some medieval buildings in the Basque country in northern Spain near San Sebastian. And uh, we still haven't been able to date the framing, but uh, so much else about the ship also suggests uh, a Basque origin, and we're looking at this area right behind San Sebastian, right in the corner of the Bay of Biscay. Uh, we have a huge amount of evidence that suggests uh, Iberian seer operations, and uh, we've got Portuguese coins found on board, a huge uh, variety and amount of environmental remains, nuts, seeds, animal bones, fish bones. It's uh, Phenomenal. What what uh, when the ship was brought in, they deballasted it, uh, and it was very clear that you had all this kind of very sterile riverine sediment from the local area, right down to the ceiling planks on the inboard of the ship. But underneath the ceiling planks, completely different. It was this black, gritty, organic, mucky stuff that was clearly associated with the use life of the ship. And it was almost hardly any sediment. It was just stuff, and you know artifacts, ecofacts, all that. So. They had, it was a very rushed excavation, it was a rescue excavation. They had uh, basically uh, all said and done, three months to uncover the ship, three months to, ex to disassemble it. So they didn't really have time to do really controlled uh, 
uh, excavation between the inner frame spaces. They just scooped up all the mud between each inner frame space, put it in bags. It took us 10 years to get around to opening those bags and processing them. But it was like the excavation all over again. Uh, monster medieval chickens, the biggest chickens they've ever found. <laughs> uh, hundreds of bones. We've got 17 different kinds of fish and shellfish. We've got pork, you know, pork joints that have been sawn uh, when they were butchered, probably salted in casks. And then you can see where they've been, it's been cooked, and then you can see where the knife marks on it, where the meat's been cut off the bone. That bone never made it over the side, it clattered down into the bilges. It's covered in rat gnaw marks, right? We have rat bones on the ship, we have monster rats, rabbit-sized rats, <laughs> that have like no teeth left, the mandibles are down to nothing, and uh, the rat marks have terrier, or the rat bones have, have dog, you know, terrier scratch marks on them. Just, just a few bones and you can start to see what life is like on board. Tons of nuts and seeds, and, and uh, just plant, plant remains, uh, palmer granites, almonds, peas, flax, it's just 26 pages of uh, plant remains. And, you know, it's, uh, we're just so lucky they actually saved the sediment. They didn't do anything with it at the time, but they had the fourth foresight to actually sample it and, uh, and just keep it on the shelf. Uh, we found, by volume, 50% of every single bag, when you washed it all out, were these little tiny, tiny leaves. And for years, they couldn't figure out what these little leaves were. And it's uh, finally cracked into something called Western Prickly Juniper. It only grows on the uh, uh, southern coast of Portugal in, these, in the dunes. It's an absolutely worthless plant. Nothing eats it. <laughs> but it, it looks like gorse or scotch broom. And it's brilliant. What they're doing, when you actually look at the plant, and you, you look at the sheer number of these little leaves preserved in the mud of the ship, no value whatsoever. Like I said, nothing eats it. But what they're doing, and it was mixed with these heather flowers. And these heather flowers from that area, heather grows right next to these other bushes. The heather only grows that time of year, or flowers, in the last couple of weeks of August uh, of, during the year in that area. Well, they're harvesting this stuff together, and the ship is filled with it. And we finally figured out it's the dunnage. They're literally putting a meter or two of this stuff in the bottom of the ship, and then they're putting all the casks on top of it. And uh, we know exactly what time of the year they're doing this because of the, uh, it's woven in with, this, uh, with these heather flowers. And it fits perfectly with the historical record where they're taking these ships, these big ships, down there and waiting for the wine. The wine is being made. Uh, the grapes are ripening. Uh, you know, old wine is not good wine. You want new, fresh wine. It's the only drinkable stuff. They're basically, the, the historical record talks about these big ships going down there and just waiting, 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 and taking the wine as soon as it's ready. And so they're preparing the ship. We found, we found hundreds of uh, cask you know, parts on board. It's very clearly a merchant ship, and we have uh, good evidence of all the, uh, that it was probably involved in the wine trade. We've got, uh, again, a huge Portuguese link. Uh, 499 out of the 500 pieces of ceramic on board are Portuguese. Uh, all different sizes and shapes of uh, vessels, but almost none of it's the same, and a lot of it has charring marks on it, and so we can interpret that as, it's like galley wear. It's, it's useful, use, uh, things that have been used during the use life of the ship, and broken and discarded as opposed to a cargo. Uh, over 30 different pieces of rigging found on board the ship, uh, all sorts. And what's interesting is it's all very small. The ship had big rigging, big blocks on it, had to have for a ship this size, but all that's missing. And what we see this over and over again, all the really big stuff that would have been easily salvageable is missing. We just find the fragments and bits and bobs uh, tucked away here and there. So I think they had time when they were cleaning the ship out prior to the refit, you know, cleaning the ballast out. They had time, oh, and maybe when it, after it fell over, they had some time to go back and uh, Hoover up all the uh, all the good bits. So we've got uh, again beautiful organic preservation, uh, lots of different kinds of leather shoes, uh, uh, archer's wrist guard, lots of you know, stone cannonballs, uh, preserved you know, uh, knife, uh, different tools on board. Uh, it's not a typical shipwreck. I mean, it's been it's not a, a moment in time. It's there's a lot that's happened to it uh, during during deposition and post deposition. But we are very we are able to definitely tie a lot of things into the use life of the ship. Uh, again, another brilliant thing was there are probably 40 or 50 different artifacts on board relating to the ship's pump. There were at least uh, four different pump holes on the ship. Uh, <coughs> standard kind of Iberian practice, there was a, they cut half of the mass, half just beyond the mast step where the uh, uh, extends into the keelson, and they cut half of that out to basically, uh, ha cut half that out to put the, one of the main pump holes. We found pump tubes, we found all sorts of uh, valves and the leather, the uh, burr valves, the uh, uh, foot valves, the pump bases, and 
what was remarkable about all of it, no matter where we found it on the ship, it was all the same size. I mean, down to the millimeter. It, there's this high, high, it's all handmade, but there's this high level of standardization for these, I, I would argue, a pretty critical part on the ship. So even though they may have had four different very organic pumps, they're all, there's a common, uh, common size here, so you can, you have spares, basically. Um, so where we're at today, we've recorded everything, we've done a lot of the post-excavation analysis of the artifacts and the uh, 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 environmental remains. We have uh, begun the conservation treatment. Everything's been soaking in polyethylene glycol for uh, since about 2008 or 9. All those huge tanks. Uh, we've freeze-dried approximately one-third of the hull, a quarter to a third of the hull of the ship. We still have, so we still have thousands of timbers to go. It's going to take us three or four more years to finish the freeze-drying process, but the results are amazing. The timbers are coming out with those inscribed lines still preserved on the surface. So we're very happy with how that, it's just really slow is the annoying part. But we've um, begun our publication process trying to distill all these, this huge amount of information down to uh, useful uh, things with a couple of IJNA articles. Really importantly, on the archiving front, uh, we've partnered up with the Archaeology Data Service in the UK, and we've deposited the first batch of files with them. There's, uh, I think it's 13,000 files are now up online with the ADS, uh, free to access, free for anyone. Uh, these are our site drawings, our reports, our, uh, all the individual timber records. Uh, everything we've done, we've had to do digitally, and it makes it quite easy to archive. And so we have a huge amount of this data pushed up there, and it's, again, free for anyone. And I mentioned things like the uh, you know, the animal bones. We've done, I think, about 50 of these specialist reports. We've packaged up as PDFs and put on this uh, website. So if anyone wants to know more about the rigging on the ship, there's two or three or 400 pages of, of expert analysis on the rigging of the ship freely available to anyone. So the last thing we're doing right now is working on the big uh, publication and uh, should take a few more years and then hopefully get this thing on display. I mean, it's absolutely amazing, uh, you know, late medieval wreck and it's, uh, We've kind of done the hard work, and I think the payoff comes when you actually get this thing on display, because it is, like I said, uh, going to be close to, well, it was 35 meters long originally, and we have about 26 meters of remains. So it's going to be a, quite a substantial uh, ship find if they ever get it on display. So that's, that's the hope. But uh, if anyone's ever in South Wales, we're two hours west of London. Uh, stop by for a visit to the ship center. We're happy to show people around. Thank you.